Welcome to the Long Thread Podcast about spinning, stitching, and weaving by hand. The podcast is presented by Long Thread Media, publishers of Spin Off, Handwoven, Piecework, and Little Looms magazines. Find us online at longthreadmedia.com. Trinway Silks is where weavers, spinners, knitters, and stitchers find the silk they love. Select from the largest variety of silk spinning fibers, silk yarn, and silk threads and ribbons at trinwaysilks.com. You'll discover a rainbow of colors thoughtfully hand-dyed in Colorado. Love natural? Trinway's array of wild silks provide choices beyond white. If you love silk, you'll love Trinway Silks, where superior quality and customer service are guaranteed. I'm your host, Long Thread Media co-founder, Ann Marrow. Deb Essen is a weaving teacher, author, and designer who works in everything from the pin loom to tablet weaving to rigid heddle and multi-shaft weaving. I spoke to her in her home in the Bitterroot Valley in Montana. We're looking forward to welcoming Deb at Weave Together, which will take place in Loveland, Colorado, February 25th through 29th, 2024. So Deb, thanks for joining me. Thank you for inviting me. I am absolutely delighted to be here. This is going to be fun. Yes, I have been looking forward to it. So one of the things that I notice about your work is that you are one of the few weavers I know who weaves on everything from multi-multi harness looms all the way down to pin looms. Do you just wake up in the morning and have a have an interest in doing something on these different looms? Or what got you interested in exploring the variety of looms available? Well, you know, that's kind of an interesting question. Um, I have never really sat and thought about it because I consider myself a structure technical weaver. I just love to see how far I can push a weave structure or play with a new weave structure. And But I still love my rigid heddle, which is where I started. And you can also push the rigid heddle. You can do pickup, you can do double heddles. The pin loom kind of came about because of Jane Patrick. Jane Patrick saw me at the TNNA wholesale show in 2013, I believe it was, when they introduced the Zoom loom. And she came over to my booth and said, would you be interested in designing kits for the Zoom loom? And I said, oh, sure. And then, because, <laughs> you know, never say no. So I play, picked up the pin loom and I started playing with it. And I went, this little thing is addicting. Uh-huh. I mean, first of all, it's really fast. You get like instant gratification. You get a square off in 10 minutes total. And then you can start playing with pickup patterns. And then you start playing with adding and subtracting or taking different colors and having the different colors work together in different ways. And I went, this simple little loom can be as complicated as I want it to be or as uncomplicated as I want it to be. And it's just, I play with everything. I mean, that's the beauty of weaving. There's something to play with all the time. (laughs) So when you say that you're a structure weaver, what kind of structures are you exploring now? Well, I'm actually working on a new book. Oh. It's going to be on profile drafting and it's going to come out from Schiffer Publishing. Hopefully next year if I make my deadline. But I I am a huge fan of summer and winter. So that's going to be the first project in this new book. And I have fallen down the summer and winter rabbit hole once again. I am having way too much fun because you can you can make all these different designs without changing your threading, without changing your blocks. And you can make it look totally different. And then you can p- combine blocks and then you can take them away. And I'm I'm having way too much fun. I'm just loving exploring, which is probably why I'm going to have to get serious about making my deadline because <laughs> I'm playing way too much with these wave structures to push them in directions to so that people go, there's more than you, you can do so much more, even though it's a profile draft. You can do so much more with this weave structure. Just play around with it. You might get the most wonderful surprise you've ever had, or you might go, yeah, yeah, it didn't work for me. And you know, and you've tried it, and it's a sample, and you're playing, and it should be fun, and it is. It's just a blast. I love pushing things into the corner. <clears throat> so you really kind of have three different ways that you explore. There's there's your, your own weaving, which I assume that you're probably doing in in some form all the time. There's weaving that you're doing for your books because there was also before this the Supplemental Warps book. And there's 
stuff that you're developing for teaching, but you also have this extensive line of kits. Then so it? how do you think about what you create for other people versus what you create for yourself? Boy, um, you know, that's actually the hardest part mm -hmm. is, first of all, I'll create something that just makes my little heart pitter patter that I go, oh, this is really cool. But then I have to think, okay, now I'd like to have kits for four shaft. I have kits for rigid heddle. I used to have pin loom and then mountain colors went and retired. I lost my my yarn supplier. So I have the rigid heddle and I like to play with that. And then I have four shaft and then eight shaft. And what I'll do is I'll come up with the design and I try to make it interesting enough that an experienced weaver will look at it and go, ooh, that would be fun. But not so difficult that a beginning weaver would go, oh, I'm so intimidated. I just, I can't even go there. Um, mm -hmm. And the hardest part about kits is color. Uh -huh. It really is. It's what color is going to sell well. What's going to make people's hearts go pitter patter. And I wind up posting some of the test stuff on my Facebook page, the business Facebook page for DJE Handwovens. And just get the feedback from people. You know, which color combination do you like the best? And I can, I've done it long enough now. I've been doing it now, I think, 13 years, oh, which is kind of a long time. <laughs> and I, I, I kind of have a feel for what's going to make, especially people in the United States, go, uh, oh, I really love that. Blue is a very, blue. very popular color. Shades of blue. Yes. Very popular. Yes. And then I also kind of like if it's from a table runner or something like that, I kind of look at the trends in design for houses and for rooms. And I'm so glad the bloody gray thing of paint your walls gray, <laughs> have your couch gray, have everything gray is going away. But then I always went, well, if you're having everything gray, then let's add some color to your life and let's pop this Absolutely, out there. Yeah. <laughs> and I think weavers are a lot the like that because I have a kit that I call, it's napkins. It's called Chasing Rainbows and it uses the colors mm -hmm. of the rainbow. And mm -hmm. that is by far the most popular kit I've ever designed. Mm -hmm. So we love color. I do not shy away from from playing with color at all. And I just put it out there and see what happens. One of the things about color is that I think everybody loves it, but people who aren't afraid to experiment with it and to put things next to each other that might not seem to go who have a lot of confidence in color, seems like that's a big advantage. That even people who love to wear color sometimes are a little bit afraid to use it in their work, probably because, okay, speaking for myself, I've had one or two things that came out and I'm like, oh, this looks muddy or, oh, this looks matchy-matchy. So, <laughs> so being able to choose colors that are kind of yours, I think is something that requires a skill. Well, I don't know if it requires as much of a skill the thing about color is it's deeply personal. Mm -hmm. There are colors that I love that somebody standing three feet away from me will be going, oh gosh, <laughs> I just don't know why. Um, and it's and it's all a deeply personal thing. So when you're picking colors, you should pick colors that make you happy, right? Mm -hmm. And then you tell mom's voice in your head that says, those colors don't go together, go up and change. <laughs> yes. Yes. You know, yep. and mm -hmm. you th she's there all the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what I always have to remember is that my mom's um, opinion of color is different than my opinion of color. And if it makes mm -hmm. me happy, then I'm I'm batting a thousand. Um, it's a little more difficult when you're trying to plan for somebody else. But then I just go, I'm just going to throw it out in the world and see what happens. And mm -hmm. there's always somebody else out there that it makes their heart sing too. And that makes me happy. Color should make you happy. That's the end result. And yeah. you should never, I play with color a lot. I do a lot of sampling. I use a <laughs> lot of lunatic fringe yarns. And when I first started using them, I would just put samples on the loom that would be sections of different colors of their yarn. And then I would weave all those same colors. And then I would just start randomly picking other mm -hmm. colors in their um, repertoire to see how they play together. And I have gotten some of the most delightful surprises out of doing mm -hmm. that. And it also made me much more confident 
about, I can now feel like after doing this for years, I go, oh, you know, I could look at two colors of a specific yarn and go, you know, I think those are going to work really well together. Uh -huh. And I always do a sample if it's for kits or something that I'm doing, even for myself or as a gift, because sometimes the color goddess says, don't get cocky. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to humble you. <laughs> you teach classes for weavers in working with color. Do you think that people find things that are surprising in that class? All the time. Mm -hmm. All the time. In fact, this last summer, I was just at the news conference, uh, the New England Weaver Seminar Conference, and I taught the color and weaving class. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we talk about a lot in that class is, first of all, um, you kind of have to throw color theory for artists out the window because that color theory is basically based on painters. Mm -hmm. And painters have definite colors in paint that they will be able to mix together in certain ratios and they will get a specific new hue out of that. We weavers have to work with the yarn that is dyed by another entity, unless we mm -hmm. go down the rabbit hole of, I'm going to dye all my no own yarn, which I found out years ago is not my gig. That is not <laughs> my gig. I love it, respect it. I don't like doing it. But so what we do is we put on a, I tell them specifics on, you know, you can use a rigid heddle, you can use a um, four shaft loom, you can use floor loom, a table loom, whatever. I want you to pick two colors and then I give them a very specific warp sequence. And what it is, is it's solids and then some color and weave um, structures in the middle and then another solid. Mm -hmm. And then we play with, with the colors and we play with how they interact each other, not only in the solids mm -hmm. where you can get a blending and get a whole new color combo that you never thought was going to happen right. or in the color and weave part of it, um, where you can see where, am I seeing the color and weave patterns or is it all just kind of turning muddy? And then we analyze them. At the end of the class, everybody looks, we've been talking about color value and color combinations and why things kind of tend to look muddy, which is usually complementary colors. Mm -hmm. They kind of go into brown. And then each person in the class talks about what they've observed. And there have been some amazing um, surprises. Well, there's always an amazing surprise for everybody in the class. And then there's the, the moment that the teacher goes, my work here is done, that someone can look at it and say, I really expected this to be this way, but now I understand that because of da-da-da-da-da-da-da, mm -hmm. this intersection of this is not working. Yeah. And um, so I always go, you know, use your color wheel as a starting point mm -hmm. to kind of open a new door for you so you don't get in your color rut, but to be able to use a color wheel and say, these two colors, because our yarns may fall, they fall into a general area, but they're not as specific as if you were able to mix paint or mix dye right. and get that exact color. Then there's also the shadow and hiding factor. I mean, you it's easy to talk about how weaving gives you points of color, but they don't necessarily mix. You wind up with one thing covering another or casting a shadow on another. Well, you know, they they kind of do. And yeah, light can affect. It's like how every once in a while we'll get that wonderful iridescent thing and uh -huh. go, how the heck did that happen? <laughs> <laughs> and what that is, iridescence happens. There's the intersection of the warp and the weft, right? Uh -huh. And iridescence is happening because it's kept, the light is catching one of the colors as you're bending it toward the light. So that's what we're calling iridescence. And we, when you interweave, like in plain weave or in a twill or whatever, what's happening is that it's actually, Joseph Albers has this book that is the color Bible for artists, yeah. right? And um, I got it because it was reprinted. It's 50 years old and it's fabulous. But Joseph Albers was, of course, Black Mountain College and the Bauhaus movement and everything. And he wrote this book and he talks a lot about optical blending. Mm -hmm. And that's another thing I talk about in my class is because what's happening with weaving is we're getting optical blending. You're 
eye is looking at those intersections of those threads, your brain is creating a new color out of it. Mm -hmm. And so it's being able to recognize, will these two blend together into the blue-green I was thinking they were going to, or are they going to look more blue? And the green is just going to completely go away. But it's all, it's, it's like, the best way I can describe it is like an, an impressionist painting, you know, those little dots of color on the, on the canvas. And when you're far away, you see the whole picture and you, and then when you get closer and closer, you're seeing those individual dots of color that are actually intermixed to mm -hmm. make that, okay, that dress is purple. But when you get up and close, you can see it's actually red and blue dots put together. It's it's a wonderful thing to play with. You know, one of the things that I have seen from your from your book and from your kits and also from what you're wearing and what's in your room right now <laughs> is that you do kind of have a signature color palette, right? Yeah, there's a lot of purples and blues and and reds and so there is a certain spectrum of color that really appeals to you. Right. The, you know, those are the colors that I kind of feel like I look good in. Mm -hmm. um, you don't see a lot of the what I call the autumn colors, even though I love orange and um, the rusts and all of that that palette, I tend not to use them very much. Mm -hmm. And so that's when I have to push myself into that whole area because I know that lots of people like that. Mm -hmm. They're out there. Although I just can't get past pumpkin, orange, and black together because it always goes, hello, Halloween is here. <laughs> yeah. Hello. Yes. <laughs> and that is, that's a cultural thing. Mm -hmm. That is, we have assigned orange and black to Halloween and it mm -hmm. just, it's kind of like red and green. Oh, yeah. Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the black does, having black helps so many other colors pop that it's really kind of a shame that you can't, that it, that it has this cultural limitation because it's like, oh, I would love to put this bright color with something that will really make it, make it pop. But no, alas. Yeah. And, and it, there are times when black can make things pop too much. Uh -huh. If you take a yellow and orange and a red and you put it with black, it can look absolutely spectacular. Uh -huh. It can also be like, oh my gosh, that hurts my eyes. Yeah. Oh, oh, that's just overwhelming. There's a couple ways that I always kind of, I call it the twist test, uh -huh. where I take the yarns that I'm planning and using and I'm twisting them together. And there are times I want them to blend together. Like if I'm doing a plaid or um, that have squares of color, I want them to blend together into a new complementary color just from the, the way my eye sees that new square. There are other times when if I'm doing something where I really want those colors to stand out like a shadow weave or something. So I'm looking for high contrast and value when I twist things together. If mm -hmm. they really... Black, you go, oh, well, black always works. Well, not if you're using a deep blue, uh -huh. not if you're using a deep green because of where it lands on the value scale, it's toward black. And so they're they're going to blend together. So I twist those yarns together. If I get a good barber pole and uh -huh. I'm doing like a shadow weave, I go, these are going to work. If I twist them together and go, mm -hmm, they kind of want to become a new color that tells me they're really close in value and I want to use them in another application where that's important. Stripe store someplace where <laughs> if you get that color blend and you get all these different colors of stripes by changing your weft. I have a um, sample that I use in class that it's about 36 inches long and it's all, it's one set of stripes and I just keep using different weft and people go, I can't believe that this section is the same warp as this section down here because they look so dramatically different. It's just so much fun, <laughs> that, you know? And it's never a waste to do sampling. You know, mm -hmm. I used to be of the um, opinion when I first started weaving that sampling was a waste of time and, you know, time and money because yarn is money, right? Until Oof. I really screwed up several... Um, Let's just say the dogs in the loom were barking really loudly <laughs> and say, you know, this really, and, and I'd go, man, that really sucks. <laughs> and a couple of them I couldn't, I couldn't save. This is then I started playing around with the, what I call the Madeline Vanderhoot sampling um, school, which is add another six to 12 inches uh -huh. of warp 
length. And then you can test your set and you can test your colors and which webs you want to use and all that stuff and everything works out until the time I put on a scarf and I had to reset it uh. much, much closer. And my nine inch wide scarf went to six and a half inches. And I went, well, that's not a practical way of doing it. And so now in the last about 10, 12 years, I've really become an advocate of, in fact, I bought my wolf pup specifically because I wanted to just put on short little samples uh -huh. and play with the different yarns and see the different color combinations that I get out of it. And then I put it into what I call my reference library, uh -huh. which is actually a box because I'm a piler, not a filer. Sorry. <laughs> It's a box that has labels on the pieces that tell me what yarns were used mm -hmm. and what set it was at. And then I can refer back to them later and go, oh, yeah, this is such and such a yarn. Oh, yeah, this is this color, this color. Oh, yeah, I can play with that. And so I have this whole big reference box. And for really organized people, you could put them in a three ring binder with little folders and, you know, all your notes and but. I'm just pleased I put them in a box. For a while, they were just in a pile. <laughs> I think if you put a label on it, that's already next level. <laughs> it's very true. It's very true. I, my husband my husband is a filer, and I am a piler. And and for those of those that go, what is she talking about piler? When you have stuff, there are people that put things that I call filers, and they put it in their place in a mm -hmm. labeled box or folder, and it's in a drawer or someplace organized that they will find it. Away. I have piles and I know where everything, I know what pile is what, and I know that these things have been stuck in those piles, but I really, have, I feel very, very organized when I get labels on them and I put them in a box. In fact, behind my computer right now, there's a pile. <laughs> Um, stuff that I've been working on. It's mostly samples yeah. and I know what's in there and they go and find it and visit. Yeah. Hey. One of the things that is really easy to do on a rigid heddle loom is play with color like that. And I, I a lot of the projects that I've seen you do for Little Looms magazine are color and weave and just explore those different interplays of different kind of colors. Yeah. I, I, I love just seeing what'll happen. And, um, when Mountain Colors Yarns was right across the valley from me, uh -huh. I used a lot of their yarns and I would just go over and, as I always said, have conversations with the yarns that are on the shelf. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then go to Diana and go, I'm taking this home with me. It's going to be a new project. And she's going, okay, fine. <laughs> Add it to the list. <laughs> Add it to the list. But yeah, I, 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 I think... As human beings, and I'm not going to say it's a cultural thing. I think it's as human beings and as general, is that we have been taught and have learned over centuries not to waste anything, mm -hmm. right? Don't waste food. Don't waste space. Don't waste this and that and the other thing. And weavers, you know, we don't waste a lot of stuff. You know, we make rag rugs out of old clothing. Right. We do all kinds of things like that. But I think we have to also remind ourselves that playing and sampling is not a waste. It is a learning experience. It's a learning opportunity. And the more you practice your craft and the more you allow yourself to have learning opportunities, the better you're going to become and you're going to be able to recognize that these things are going to work together. You have little tricks that you've developed. You you know th what the shrinkage is on a particular yarn because you've washed your samples and you know, oh, this one in this weave structure is going to do the, hello, I'm becoming microman. <laughs> <laughs> you know, where it's just like, oh my gosh, I can't believe it shrunk that much. <laughs> but yeah, I, I I really think you need to play. We just do, as adults, we just do not give ourselves enough opportunities and enough permission to play. And when we were kids, everything was fair game. Mm -hmm. We learned by playing. We need to remember that as adults, mm -hmm. that we are learning, even though we're technically not making a thing, you know, that's going to be used. You are. You're making something that will be your reference yeah. for future. And you're learning. It almost seems reductive to put it in economic terms, but 
in a way, it's an investment sampling and, and that sort of thing. It's spending time and money and energy now so that in the future, you'll be better at your skill or you'll make a better thing. Absolutely. Yeah, it is an investment. It's an investment in knowledge. Mm-hmm. And knowledge is what makes you a better weaver. You learn Once you learn how to throw the shuttle and you learn how to treadle, those are the mechanics. But the knowledge part of it that you gain as you practice your craft is becomes this wealth that you just keep accumulating and then, you know, eventually might want to share with other people by teaching mm-hmm. and say, here's the things I did. And not everyone's brain works the same way. There are very analytical people on the opposite end, people that are more, let's just go with the flow and see what happens. Mm-hmm. Most of us are kind of in between. We have a little of both and you need to indulge the let it flow. Let's see what happens. The curious child that really does reside in all of us, curiosity will get you farther in so many things than saying, I must follow these rules and these rules will get me to this spot every time. Sometimes. (laughs) Well, but in a way, it's it's interesting that we're that we're speaking this way. Very early on, one of the criticisms of Handwoven Magazine and why people thought maybe it shouldn't even be a thing was that it was not weaverly to follow directions. That weavers shouldn't need someone to tell them what set to use and what yarn to use and what draft. That it should be you should know you should have the the knowledge and then make a project from that. And I'm sure that many people do take the projects in Handwoven and. Many people probably take them and make them as written, and many people take them and use them as jumping off points. But there's also a pleasure in in saying, I am going to enjoy knowing what I'm going to get. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, and there, everybody is a little different. There are people who like to experiment, mm-hmm. and there are people that like to know what they're going to get at the end. Mm -hmm. Right. And then there's in-betweeners, you know, there's all kinds of mixtures in there for. And the thing I love about weavers is if you absolutely love, like, let's take Lee's Surrender, which is a classic overshot pattern, right? I've woven that. Lots and lots of people have woven that. It's a fabulous overall design. Mm -hmm. Uh, But you can make it your own by oh, I'm not going to make it exactly that size. I'm going to have the borders be this size. I'm going to have the center be this size. It's going to be a scarf rather or a shawl. And that's where your creativity can kick in, but it doesn't have to. It's still a very successful project if you make it exactly like the picture because the picture makes your heart sing. <laughs> and if it made your heart sing, do it. If If you went... Well, that's a good stop at starting off point. I'm going to do this and I'm going to change this a little bit. And that makes your heart sing. Do it. I think we get too bound up in, you know, we have to follow the rules. Yeah. I can't tell you how many weaving rules I've broken and not all of them on purpose. They've been kind of like, oh, what the heck did I do there? And that's actually kind of cool. <laughs> and how could I do it again? <laughs> yeah. What did I do? I must remember this. Yeah. Um, yeah, one I have, do you want to hear one time I broke the broke the rules and it, Absolutely. It, oh god, it was so funny. I bought I took a class with Joanne Hall when she had Glamocra USA. And Montana is full of fiber artists and Joanne was up in Helena and I took a class from her and fell in love with the Glamocra loam that I was weaving on. I had a 48-inch Kesnick Jack loom all oak And if you put on a tight warp and you had to press on the treadles for a tight, wide warp, you were like standing on that puppy. Mm -hmm. But the Glamocra, I could just do with my toes. I was like in love. So I bought the loom, brought it home, followed the directions, put on the first warp, which was an overshot. And as I'm weaving, I'm going, it's not like the drawdown. Why is it not like the drawdown? And then I went, oh, the, um, and it took me a while to figure this out because it's a draft for a jack loom, which is a rising shed. Yeah. And the glamocra is a sinking and rising. They both do, but it's a sinking shed. So what's happening is my pattern was on the underside of the fabric. The, oh. the, 
main drawdown pattern was there. And I sat there and I did it and I went, but I wanted on top. Uh-huh. And I thought about it and the counter marsh looms have two sets of lambs. There's the lower lambs and the upper lambs. And you, the way I was told in the instructions is the upper lambs were tied to the X's and the um, lower lambs were tied to all the blank spots on the tie-up, which is what I did and which is why everything was upside down because I used a jack loom draft. So I went, well, what if I tie up the lower lambs to the X's or the colored in squares and the upper lambs to all the blanks? Because what goes up, what is up must go down and what is down must go up. Did that? Boom. I can use any jack tie up and my pattern was on the top. So I told Joanne about that and she was horrified. She was horrified. <laughs> She said, oh, no, 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 you can't do that. That's not how it's done. And I said, well, why not? Why can't I do that? And she said, well, because it's just not how how it's done. I said, well, traditions are meant to be broken. This works Uh beautifully for me. So several years later, both Joanne, um, Global Working USA and Joanne Hall and Ed Hall were at the Intermountain Rush Weavers Conference and the Julia Loom had just come out. Uh which is that small counter marsh that they have, which is a lovely little loom. And I'm I'm looking at it with Joanne and I said, well, what are these black beads on the lower lambs? And she kind of looks at me and she goes, well, I told Glamokra that because Americans are so used to jack loom um, tie-ups that we put the black beads down on the lower lambs so they could tie it up to the black colored in squares on their jack loom tie-ups. And I said, so it does work, (laughs) doesn't it? (laughs) And she was like, yeah, you know, the I, yes, it does. But yeah, it was, I broke the rules. It works out great. And then suddenly it's become accepted because traditions are sometimes meant to be broken. (laughs) You know, I think for weavers, we talk a lot about the the question, what if, but maybe the next question is, why not? Exactly. Exactly. Why can't I? I was kind of a, as my father said, a challenging child because <laughs> my favorite words were why and why can't I? And he always had to have a really good reason for the why. And I still do that. Why can't I do that? Well, the I'll try. The worst thing that's going to happen is it may not work out like I plan. Right. But, you know, it, this one happened to work out brilliantly. <laughs> <laughs> Do you mind if we, if we go from the very large and complex to the very small and simple? I love your little pen loom designs. And, and you mentioned that they used to be kits. By the way, I love the idea of running a tab at the yarn store. Never mind running a tab at the bar. You run a tab at the yarn at the mill. I love it. <laughs> it can be very dangerous. I'm sure. It can be very dangerous. I mean, when I get to a time, I'd go in and pick up an order and I'd go, mm-hmm. by the way, I've got some stuff on my tab. And Diana would tell me and I'd go, dang, I've been having fun. <laughs> <laughs> but you never get a hangover. You never no, get a hangover. That's true. That's true. <laughs> you took those pin loom squares and made mostly mostly animals, right? Mostly little little figures. What made you decide to transform these into something three-dimensional? Well, because um, the thought went through my head and I decided to grab it. In fact, there's a book coming out with Uh Schiffer Uh next year, for sure, because it's already there, that's going to be all the swatch critter patterns. Oh. All 30 of them. And the very first one, the very first time I went home and I had this new Zoom Loom, and I had some mountain colors yarn that I was, because I had bunches of it, and I was weaving in. It was a green yarn, and I said, hmm, because I'm going, what am I going to do as a kit for this? I mean, a scarf seems pretty uninspired. Uh-huh. Um, could do a pillow. And then I went, gee, I wonder if I can make a turtle. Just this random thought went through my head. So I wove up some green, and I wove up some orange I had, and I the first one looked a lot more like an armadillo <laughs> than a turtle. Figured it out, and uh, you know how to put these squares together because I'm really good at spatial relations. If you want somebody to pack a truck, 
I'm your lady. I can <laughs> I can look at the stuff and get it in there. So then I made a turtle and uh-huh. it just went from there that they were cute. They were small. They um, were something. And I tried to make my critters more realistic than like little stick guys so that you could look at them and go, that's it. That's a unicorn. I can see that that's a horse with a, you know, unicorn or that's a turtle or although I did get a lot of grief from a uh, herpetologist friend when I made um, the chameleon and she said, we have to talk about chameleons. (laughs) (laughs) I said, I know, I know. There's a couple things. (laughs) Yeah, a couple things. But, you know, that's, it was just because I had this random thought and I made two dot the turtle and just kept going. And you know, you can make bigger animals because you add more squares and uh-huh. fold them into different shapes so that um, those different shapes becomes arms and heads. And yeah, it's yeah. it's fun. And I really, really, really suck at geometry. I want to tell you this. <laughs> I really, really do. And, but I can put things together. I can put shapes together. Uh-huh. But don't ask me to play pool because I really am bad at pool. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. So there's there's spinning things together, but then there's also the the joining. Did did you have a background in stitching? Do you like sewing? Oh yeah, that's that's where it started. The whole fiber journey for me. Um, my mom was a home economics teacher. Oh, did wonderful seamstress work, and she taught me to sew when I was about eight nine somewhere in there. And I was I was in 4-H all the way through till I graduated from high school, and I was in the clothing projects and did a lot of handwork. Um, I didn't get into quilting because it just didn't trip my trigger. But yeah, I I learned to sew when my feet could reach the presser foot. <laughs> uh, I think one of the things that people find challenging about working with pin loom squares is getting them to look nice when you put them together. The the seaming, the joining is challenging. It, it can be. The The way that I do have it is I call it a quarter inch seam, which if you stitch between the second and third rows of the pin loom squares and you do a running stitch along and you keep going in that between the second and third in the holes in between, you get a nice straight seam. Huh. And so that seemed to be the easiest. And then there's a lot of times where it's just a whip stitch through the loops that are on the edge. And that makes a beautiful seam too. Mm -hmm. And then um, there's a lot of hemming stitch. As I'm fond of saying, um, if you can sew on a button or do a hem, you can make a swatch critter. And that was my goal. And I have, I have one of the things that just, it's such a wonderful feeling that I would get these random emails from people that have done a kit of mine. It could be a lot of, I get a lot of critter ones mm-hmm. and they'll email it to me and say, Hey, I, I did this up and I wanted you to see my take on it. And it's so much fun because everybody's personality, even though they're following my pattern, they've created a new personality in this critter that I had one, I have a kit that was Teton the teddy bear and it's a big teddy bear. It's like 12 inches tall. And um, last year, I think it was, um, someone emailed me and she had taken and made Teton into Tina, the teddy bear, for her great granddaughter that was just born. And she had knitted a bow for the top of her head. And instead of knitting the sweater um, the way that the pattern did, she left it unbuttoned and then crocheted pink around the edges. I mean, it's just... Her whole personality just just changed 100%. And I love that. I think it's so fabulous that, you know, someone took this, then created their own interpretation of it in in a way that is shows respect for both sides, I guess. It's, you know, I'm not doing exact copy. And then I get ones that are, you know, an exact copy, but they're so pleased because this is really their first stitching thing they'd ever done. And they look fabulous. They just are fun. And they're a low pressure kind of thing. You know, it's not like you have to go to your husband and say, I've knitted you this beautiful thing. Let's see if the sleeves are the same length. And then you go, well, no, they're not. <laughs> and then please and then please don't run it through the dryer. <laughs> 
boy, do I admire people that knit sweaters. I'm a socks kind of gal. In Montana, I imagine you probably have a lot of call for wool socks. Um, Actually, yes. Um, We uh, we tend to get cool quickly and stay there for a long time. And... uh, (laughs) In fact, fall is definitely fell, although where I live in the Bitterroot Valley, um, they call it the banana belt of Montana. For some reason, this valley stays warmer than if you just go over the mountain range and you go onto the plains. It's been known to be 20 degrees above zero in the Bitterroot and 20 below wow. in Bozeman. It's one of those weird little things. Well, I kind of wanted to ask you about that because there's a there's a real sense of place about your work in a way, maybe it just sneaks in in subtle ways from your, in the photography and your Easy Weaving with Supplemental Warps book and, you know, speaking about other Montana artisans and things like that. But it, it seems like being a Montana artisan is important to you. It is important to me. Um, there is such a deep, wide tradition of fiber arts in Montana that I did mm-hmm. not appreciate when I first, we first decided to move here. In fact, when we first decided to move here, I kind of went into a panic attack because when I was, I had wanted to learn to weave since since I was about nine years old. My mom Mm -hmm. took me to a Lucia Day celebration at our church. I was supposed to help. She was working in the kitchen. I was supposed to help by bussing tables, but there was a lady there who had a spinning wheel and a loom, and she was demonstrating both. And I thought it was just absolutely magical. I think I bussed one table. The rest of the time I spent watching her. And I just said, oh, I've just got to learn how to do this. I've got to learn how to do this. And then, of course, life get, you know, life just goes so fast. And pretty soon I was in my 30s and we came out to Montana to the Bitterroot for a vacation, just fell in love. We had been wanting to move out of Minneapolis and we went, let's go for it. We can do this. We'll just change the letterhead on the business. We'll go. And then I kind of had this panic attack of going, we're moving to Montana. I still don't know how to weave or spin. And um, who's going to teach me? And so I joined the Minnesota Weavers Guild because we lived in Minneapolis. I took beginning spinning, intermediate spinning, rigid heddle, floor loom. I jammed in as many classes as I possibly could. Then I get out here and discover you can't swing a purse without hitting a fiber artist in Montana. <laughs> They're everywhere. And, you know, Mary Miggs Atwater was based in Basin, Montana. Really? Yep. When she did the Shuttlecraft newsletter... She did it out of Basin, Montana, which was a mining town. It's still a teeny tiny little town. And she did it all out of Basin, Montana. She started eight weaving guilds in in Montana back in the 30s. Two of them are still in existence. It's the Helena Weavers Guild and the Missoula Weavers Guild, and they just celebrated their 75th anniversaries. Wow. Isn't that amazing? That's really impressive, yeah. I told my husband once I found out all these weavers and spinners, I said, I knew uh, moving to Montana was right. I just had that feeling. When you create all these kits, do you actually build them yourself? Oh, yeah. All the warps that come are are already wound in my kits, Mm -hmm. right? And so I wind all the warps. It's me, myself, and I. And I'm one of those oddities in the weaving world that I really like to wind warps and I really like to dress my loom. Uh. And then the weaving part of it is I'm really fascinated with about the first 12 inches and then I'm like, well, what else can we do? (laughs) The reason I like warping, I think, is um, I like taking from what is something on a piece of paper and a concept and then I can start seeing how it's going to work and Really, when you wind your warp and you're threading, it's all the only time you're actually touching your yarn until it's done. Think about that. Because when you're weaving, the loom is raising and lowering your warp threads and the shuttle is holding your weft. So your hand you're not you're holding the wood or whatever is happening and you're not feeling and touching unless you stop. But when you're warping, it's gliding through your your fingers, and you can you can feel the yarn and how it acts. And you mm-hmm. go, oh, this is pretty stretchy. I'm going to keep that in mind. I'm going to add a little bit more warp length because it's going to stretch and then really shrink a lot. So you learn so much, but then it's such a nice tactile part until you actually get done 
we don't actually get to have that tactile feeling as we do when we work. I've never thought of that. I'm not one of the people who who is much of a worker. So. Well, and you know, I and, th- and that's fine. I mean, basically, I said, you know, I said, well, I'll wind the warps because that's the place where you can really screw things up, mm-hmm. and um, then they get a good warp that is secure and wound correctly and then that frustration is gone and then it's also for the actually vast majority of weavers don't want to wind their own work mm-hmm. you know totally. they just want to go and weave and so the first time i sold kits was at convergence albuquerque mm-hmm. was my first show of my first time i said i'm going big or i'm going home if this works when with the people that go to convergence it's going to work and it did and um, the, my little tagline was, it's instant gratification weaving. Uh-huh. You take everything out. It's all planned out. You can take it right to the loom and you can put it on and you know when it gets done, but you're still weaving. You're still doing the yeah. whole mechanics of the whole thing. And then you can take and interpret it because you have the pattern. And so you can interpret it however you want to in another reiteration of its life. How many of them do you do at a time? Depends. I usually design new stuff about once a um, over a process of a year. I'll get an idea will get stuck in my head, and then I sample, and then I create the the project sample. And since I only sell wholesale to retailers, there are some weeks where I have several orders that I fill, and there then there are weeks where I don't have any orders to fill. And it depends on how many they want to have in stock. And it's quite fun. I mean, the Woolery actually carries all of my kits. Wow. And bless their heart, they've been a wonderful retail partner. Uh, Yarn Barn has them. Lunatic Fringe has, and thinking they're just online people, uh, but Lunatic Fringe has all the kits that use their yarns. And then I had a bunch of yarn shops when I used to do the TNNA shows, the wholesale shows, lots of yarn shops all over the place. Um, And that's kind of died down post-COVID. H&H America has taken filled this slot that the National Needle Arts Association, which was TNNA, used to do this wholesale show twice a year. And now H&H Americas, which is H&H from Europe, I don't even know what H&H stands for. It's something like hobby and hand arbite or something like that? Something like that. But they they do a huge, a ginormous hand um, craft market in Europe, and now they're doing it in the United States. And they've kind of taken, they're working with the TNNA board to get this off the ground. And I'm going to confess something, Uh having just crossed that threshold of, what do you mean I'm old enough for Medicare? (laughs) (laughs) And I said, you know, I have to sit and think about where, where I want to go over the next five years. Mm-hmm. And right now I'm really, really content having three, four large online retailers and not doing those shows to get the yarn chops. And that's the first time I've actually said that out loud to anybody other than my husband. Oh my gosh. And now it's out in the universe. Oh no. <laughs> well, and you need to have some time to write all these books. Yeah. You know, so what I did, when I proposed easy weaving, I had no idea what was involved with writing a book. I just thought I I was playing with the idea and I was, had been playing with supplemental warps and, you know, and I told my husband, I said, I'm thinking that I'm going to do the certificate of excellence level two because I have the level one through Hand Weavers Guild of America. I think I'm going to do the level two on supplemental warps and see how it goes and then maybe I'll write a book. And he goes, why? (laughs) And he said, why don't you just write the book and not go through all of the developing stuff for the level two? And I really didn't have a good answer. So at that time, Interweave, as you well know, was owned by F&W. And so I sent off some weaving samples, proposed the book, and and the website said, give us 60 days to get back to you. And I said, oh. No problem. Sent it off. Life is good. And literally the next day, I got a call from Anita Osterhout, who at that time was editor Mm -hmm. of Hand Woven. And she said, I've been waiting for someone to do these books. 
uh, a book on supplemental works. We want you to do the book on supplemental works. And I was like, wow. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. And I was very cool. I was very cool on the phone. Oh, that's wonderful. Da, 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 da. And I got off the phone and literally, can I say, can I say a four letter word on the air? Is that okay? <laughs> I might have to bleep it, but go ahead. <laughs> oh, okay. I went, holy sh I'm writing a weaving book. <laughs> holy sh what have I done? <laughs> Oh my yeah. God. And it is one of the best things I've ever done and one of the hardest things I've ever done. Uh -huh. Because books are it was so, it's so much fun. And I always lecture, you know, say to people in my classes, write stuff down, write stuff down because uh -huh. the weavers of the future will so appreciate that you have written your stuff down and you in a year from now will so appreciate that you wrote stuff down. The hard part about books is to take what for me is very easy, easy which is to verbally teach people and to yes. show them with my, you know, by me demoing to them and translate it into the written word that holds together and makes sense. And then to figure out what pictures I have to have in there so that the demonstration part goes with it. And so, and, and and it's a humbling, it's a humbling experience, but it's also one of the, it's the most fun I've had in, in a long time huh. is it's a challenge. I let my imagination run free and, you know, play with stuff. And I learned so much along the way because I will actually dig down into a weave structure more than I ever did by just playing with the weave structure. And things like that. And so they're a lot of fun. And then you have to, the other thing I have to do is I have to remember that there are verbal learners and there are visual learners. And what I work, try really hard to do is to be able to marry those two things um, in the book. So the visual learners have the pictures with a caption underneath them that tells them, here's the steps. But the verbal learners who do better if they can read something through and then look at a picture. Mm -hmm. To have all of that, all those necessary little building blocks put together is a real challenge. It it takes a lot of time. And God bless my husband because he's my sounding board and we'll go on walks and I'm going on about the warp and the blah, 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 blah. And he's just going, uh-huh, 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 uh-huh. And we'll get, and then I'll go, but. Now, because for me, I need to verbalize all of this. He has no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> no idea. He knows what warp is. He knows what weft is. And he knows what the loom is. But for me to be able to talk through it, then I'll be able to go back and actually put it into a keyboard. It's it's just a very interesting thing. It's yeah. not what I expected when I first said, oh, I'm going to write a book. <laughs> I used to be a book editor and to a couple of people that I that I told this is going to change the way I know that you teach this. And and when people would say, well, I know how to do this. I know how to explain this because I teach it all the time. And explaining mm -hmm. that when you're in a classroom, first of all, you can pick up on people's cues. But secondly, you have a rapport with them. You have a trust with them. They're not going to get up and leave. Mm -hmm. So being able to structure something in the book and guide somebody through the process in a way that's going to keep them engaged all the time, that's going to anticipate their questions at the right time. It's a very different sort of experience. It's totally different. And like I noticed when we switched over to doing Zoom classes during the pandemic, the thing that was hardest for me was that I, when I teach, I scan the room. And mm -hmm. if I see, I there are, there are facial expressions that you know, there's the little nodded, eyebrows and the frowns or somebody's, you know, just having trouble. And I know that I just need to work my way over. And so, so is there something I can help you with? Uh -huh. But with Zoom, I don't have that. It's, it's really hard. And um, I'm really glad we're back to in-person stuff, but it's the same thing with writing a book. Okay. Where do I usually see knotted brows or where do you have those light bulb moments somebody has, which are the most satisfying thing in the world when you're a teacher? You can tell that somebody all of a sudden goes, oh, 
I get it. I get it. I get it. I get it. Get it. Get it. Get it. Yeah. And how to translate that into paper and pictures. And I have to say that with easy weaving, with supplemental warps, I, you know, you send it out into the world and hope it works. And the very first email I got from somebody was kind of a double-edged sword. Um, it was just a month or two after the book came out. And she said, I want you to know I bought your book. And I was really nervous about learning how to weave from a book. <laughs> but then this is the part that just made me go, yes. She said, but for the first time ever, I was able to follow the instructions and get it done and figure it out. And I just had to let you know that you were successful in communicating to someone who usually can't learn from a book. And oh, by the way, yeah. And then, oh, by the way, there's a typo. <laughs> <laughs> and I went, you're kidding me. She said, yeah. I, she said, page 18, paragraph, blah, 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 blah. And I looked at it and I went, three of us proofed this. Three people proofed this. And that one slipped right by all of us. <laughs> one of my One of my sayings all the time is that Mistakes will come forward when they are re ready to reveal themselves. <laughs> That's right. They just I didn't think, pick that yeah. moment. <laughs> yeah. I think there's a little gremlin in another dimension that goes, okay, we're just going to let them overlook this. Let them overlook this. Aha, uh -huh, now they can. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm really glad that we're back to in-person classes too. And I'm, we're especially looking forward to having you come teach at Weave Together in February 2024 with your color class and pin loom classes. And it's just been so much fun to talk to you. And I can't wait to see you in person. Well, I'd, I'm looking so forward to coming to Colorado. I mean, it's going to be it's going to be fun. And it's really neat that it's a small group. I mean, hey, you're closing it, holding it at 50 people. Mm -hmm. And there are tons of classes. I'm once again having that moment as a teacher that said, dang, I'm teaching. I can't take that class. That makes me kind of disappointed. <laughs> Because I'm teaching at the same time that class is happening. Dang it. <laughs> but yeah, there's a lot of good stuff. It's going to be fun. And because it's what, 50 people, right? Mm -hmm. 50 people, all-inclusive, all -inclusive, so yeah. everything. So you uh, you can come and, and sit with people at dinner and find out what they learned in the other classes. Oh, well, that's true. I can yeah. pick everybody's brains, can I? Yeah. Let me see what you're doing. Come on, show me, <laughs> show me. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. It'll be, it'll be fun. Deb, thanks so much for your time. Well, thank you. This has been a delight to chat with you. It has been a, re I have no idea how long we've been sitting and chatting, but I, <laughs> oh, it's been much longer. I just looked at my watch. It's good to see you on the screen. And I so look forward to actually seeing you again in person in, in February. And we're going to have, we're going to have a blast. Thank you for listening to the Long Thread Podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, please rate the show and leave us a comment on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast platform. Thanks again.